The Royal Air Force in the Battle of Britain is legendary, and the glamorous image of the fearless airmen has become part of our national folklore. But in reality, the summer of 1940 was a terrifying time for many fighter pilots, none more so, perhaps, than the inexperienced part-time flyers of Bristol's own 501 Squadron. By the autumn of 1940, 501 had become one of the RAF's most successful squadrons, having produced 13 ace pilots and shot down over 140 enemy aircraft. But their achievements came at a price, the loss of 30 airmen. With a life expectancy of only 20 hours in the air, it was a feat just to live up to the squadron motto, fear nothing. I felt um, more than vulnerable because of my own experience, and I, I wasn't alone. I wasn't alone in this. I'm sure. Anticipation is probably the worst part of it. In that, you know, where are they? I can't see them, and what you can't see, you get frightened about. At the outbreak of war, 501 County of Gloucester Squadron, based in Filton, was little more than a flying club for part-time auxiliary pilots. Keith Aldridge was working for the Bristol Aeroplane Company when he spotted the squadron training on the runway. Round in the corner of the airfield was the city of Bristol squadron, the auxiliary squadron, 501. Uh, I had a sneaking feeling right from the word go that, uh, you know, I'd like to join that uh, elite band out in the corner there. And... Uh, as it turned out, I was accepted into that, I suppose, elite sort of uh, company. And privileged you were to uh, be a member of the uh, 501 Squadron. I learned how to fly, uh, but not how to fight. I hadn't got any fighting instinct in me as such. I was merely a weekend flyer who had learned to fly rather poorly although they rated me as exceptional, but uh, that really didn't mean very much. I think all pilots were rated as exceptional, because if they weren't, they weren't accepted. <laughs> Bill Green was encouraged to sign up for an auxiliary unit by his employers and joined 501 Squadron as a fitter before becoming a pilot. He married his fiancée Bertha in June 1940. The thought of becoming a pilot was absolutely beyond my wildest dreams and uh, it was wonderful for me and I, I couldn't believe my luck. Bertha knew that there was a war on and so it was a dangerous time and, and she would know that my, ex my chances of coming through were remote but she wanted to be married. Bill and Bertha were not alone in their desire to marry quickly as the outbreak of war had a dramatic effect upon marriage rates in Britain. Vicar's daughter, Mary Lalonde, married her sweetheart, Michael Smith, shortly before the conflict began. Michael was also an auxiliary pilot with 501 Squadron. I met him at a hunt ball um, in um, Brockley Coombe. He really was great fun, I must say. He was typical of what you might think a fighter pilot might be. And because the war was imminent, we got married probably sooner than we would have done ordinarily, but uh, we pushed it forward. Obviously, he knew the dangers much more than his. I was only 21 when I was engaged, and I, I, I must admit, I mean, the whole thing, the, the thought of war was awful to say it now, but was a little bit on the glamorous side. It was, it, there was a sort of frisson of excitement about it all. And, and certainly there was a great glamour attached to the squadron, all of them. German plan for invasion of England. Phase one. Knock out the Royal Air Force and its bases. Get control of the air and the sea lanes across the channel. Follow the Blitz plan that had wiped out Poland, the Low Countries, and France. Destroy communication and transport lines. Above all, get command of the air. With the threat of invasion increasing, the men of 501 left Filton for Kent and experienced pilots from around the country were drafted in to make up the squadron numbers. It was a worrying time for novice flyer Bill Green. 
Well, it was all, it was really quite fearsome, I think, quite frightening, because it was all a strange new world to me, and uh, I knew little or nothing about what was going on, and uh, everybody was too involved looking after their own life to spend time talking to splogs like me. So I was more than green by name and green by nature. And we had a visit from some senior brass hat from divisional headquarters who said that they were expecting, to, we were expecting to be invaded, that the airplanes would be towed by Junkers 88s, and that we were to try and destroy the towing aircraft. And when we fired at the gliding aircraft with the, the troops in it, we were to fire until we saw blood coming out of the hinges of, of, of the frame of the door. After just three hours experience in a hurricane fighter, Flying enthusiast Keith Aldridge got his first taste of aerial combat. The alarms went that the uh, Germans were bombing the airfields around. And I think it was the station commander saying, you got pilot? And he said, well, get, take this one off, get it off the ground. So off I went and got, took it off the ground. I didn't know where I was going, but I thought, well, hang around somewhere near the airfields, they're going to bomb the airfield, I might, might, might see them have a squirt at them, I suppose. I eventually did. I, I met up with a um, Mr. Smith 110, I think, uh, up on his tail, and I was going to fire at him, and um, he suddenly did a turn. I wasn't ready for his doing a turn, so <laughs> he must have been laughing his head off. Newlyweds Michael and Mary found life apart difficult, but wrote to one another often. We, we both of us, he there and I here, um, used to watch the postman come. So we were telling each other how much we missed each other and how much we loved each other and, uh, you know, how long would it be before we saw each other, all that sort of thing, as newlyweds would. And funnily enough, Michael was on a 24-hour pass and the phone went and he said, I'll bet that's the mess. And it was. And, um... They flew out that afternoon. The squadron soon began to settle into a routine, and the pilots learned to dread the ring of the telephone, which to some became a portent of injury or death. The life that we lived was sitting in, or laying in a, a, a dispersal tent, with the airplane sitting around outside, with the parachute in and the harness straps in position, ready for you to run out and jump in and buckle yourself up and get off the ground when the telephone rang and you were told to scramble. Most of the time that I was sat there, you were hoping that it wouldn't ring because the, the ring of the telephone possibly meant that you were going to be scrambled and you were going to be having to get into the air to face enemy aircraft and possible death or wounding or whatever. I did fear it. I hoped it would never ring. But it did ring more and more frequently. As the Luftwaffe increased their raids, the squadron was often scrambled several times a day, and dogfights with German fighters became common. It was a time of intense pressure, undoubtedly. Basically, you start putting tighter and tighter turns, uh, and the time comes when either he knows that you're catching him closer, or you know it, he's turning inside you for some reason or another. But uh, when you fire your guns, then you will smell the cordite. Even though they're in the wings and far out from you, you can smell the guns. And you can hear the rattle of them because you're, you're putting out, what is it, 1,300 rounds a, a minute from each gun times eight, eight times 1,300. That's a lot of blooming. A lot of blooming bangs going off. Despite the popular image of a happy, unified squadron, many pilots remained solitary figures. With colleagues being killed daily, many preferred not to form close friendships. For 501's part-time pilots, this meant having to learn their skills the hard way. You'd have thought that uh, the, the old pilots would have said, well, look, this, this, is, this is the form. This is how you will come up and, and, and dogfight with me or whatever. That would have been an experience which would have been, uh, made me a better pilot than nothing else. I felt um, 
more than vulnerable because of my own experience. And I would also value somebody telling me a bit of how to fly the airplane effectively to avoid being shot out of the sky. Bill Green's worries were not unfounded, and after only nine days in combat, his inexperience nearly cost him his life. The weather was bad, the cloud was quite low, and I didn't think there was any hope that we would, A, have bombers to attack, or that we would be able to get off the ground to attack them. And I, was, I sat down and wrote to Bertha, saying that she, I didn't want her to worry, and she certainly didn't need to worry that day because the cloud was so low, we certainly wouldn't fly. When, uh, uh, at six o'clock in the evening, we were scrambled. I saw absolutely nothing, and suddenly there was a crash of glass. Something crashed through there and made a hole about as big as, uh, larger than a tennis ball, nearly as big as a baseball. I, I heard the glass falling around my feet, and uh, I realized the airplane was finished. The, the stick was just like nothing, and I, I realized I had to get out. I uh, already had the hood back, and I got as far as um, taking the weight off my bottom on my feet, when suddenly, pfft, I was out. <laughs> 